Any questions about anything economics related? Lovely, you're looking at me like I'm like you're worried about me, <laughs> which is probably fair, but still. You just had that look. Okay. Uh, we started talking, whatever that day was, Tuesday, whenever I got a working computer. Uh, we were talking supply is our willingness and ability to produce. And we talked about for some things, we are part of the supply, we just haven't, it hasn't kicked in yet. We have the ability to grow watermelons, you had the willingness to grow watermelons, but the price is just too low, you're not doing it yet. Right. But then we got to demand. Oh, my starboard's not working again today. That's stupid. Oh, I'm going to get all twitchy and I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, what does that do? Nothing. What? I'm sorry, I'm trying to see if I can fix this thing. Okay. Too bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now the over under on how many times I'm going to touch the screen and not have any results. Anybody want to take, anybody want to take a bet? I'll lean on that, yes. Okay. Demand was our ability and willingness to consume, to use a product. Some people demand, Loveling demands M&Ms because she loves M&Ms. Preston demands heroin because I don't know if love is quite the right word, but you know, he, he, yeah, he's got to have it when he's got to have it, right? He's going to be downright twitchy, maybe ready to stab somebody in the eyeball with a pencil if he doesn't get his heroin in a timely fashion, right? It's, is it heroin? It's coke. Coke, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just, I should, it should be able to tell a white powder even though it's not. Anyway. Um, but we have our ability and we have our willingness to consume products. Um, at different price levels, is going to make it easier and make us want to consume more of them versus less of them. And just, just to get us on the same piece of paper where we are mentally, th this is where we stopped last time. And just sort of bear, remember that Love Lean was allergic to peanuts, right? So we're going to come back to that. Okay, that's fine. Did you say that we remind you about the third thing? Oh yeah, that you're allergic to dirt. About what? That Sam's allergic to dirt. Can you come back to it this class? Okay, Sam is allergic to dirt. Okay, that uh, uh, peanut, same thing. Okay. Oh, okay. But well, the, the dirt allergy is coming later, but the peanut allergy is coming soon. Oh, I, and we actually ended up, we were talking about my what, eagle eyeball soup the other day. That they suddenly demand if people are willing to buy the product and ain't nobody wanting to eat eagle lip soup or eagle eyeball soup. So there's no need for me to even bother to make it. Um, so the law of demand, remember in your science classes, what did they tell you a law was? Something's proven, it's true, right? It's truth with a capital T, true. The law of demand says when, okay, don't write it this way. I really need to fix my slide. I can't write on my board. so. It's, when the price goes up, we buy less. When the price goes down, we buy more. You write one of them, the other, I mean, because it, it's the same thing. The higher the price goes, we, it kind of makes sense. The higher the price goes, we can't afford to buy as much. All right. Um, Bobby only makes $100 a week. So if the price of M and of, well, if the watermelons goes beyond hundred dollars a piece, you know he had, he can't buy any, right? If the price gets below a dollar, I mean below hundred dollars, he actually can buy one, right? But he wouldn't be able to buy two until the price dropped down to fifty dollars a piece, right? But still, fifty dollars. If all he's got is hundred bucks, is he could spend half of that on a watermelon? Yeah. No. If his name was Preston, and we were saying cocaine, then maybe, but yes, no. But generally speaking, the lower the price gets for stuff, the more that we end up buying as customers, the more they end up selling as a business. So if you want to increase how much you sell, 
selling cars, selling sodas, selling chainsaws, selling watermelons, lower your price, people will buy more. But of course, that's, you know, that assumption of rational behavior that we talked about two weeks ago. I always touch for So. All right, this is gonna hurt since we don't have a working artwork. Okay, don't worry about doing this. We just, th th this is something that exists, a demand schedule. We can make a table where we look at how much people would buy at different price levels. In a given time period, just how much would we buy at different prices? Is a demand schedule. This is just the, this is the intro. This is somebody pointing you to the car. We haven't started learning how to drive yet, right? The driving is coming in the next few slides here. We haven't got to the good part because it's just foundational. So here's an example for you. Um, let's see, we're talking about, I don't know, packs of gum per week. How many packs of gum would, give me the name of a human. Frank. Frank. Don't, don't. Oh, up. no, there's a slight chance that that would uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I know that's, a, a, no, because, no, I have an F over here on the other screen here. Uh, uh, there's an F to the end. You, you turn it on. Oh, oh no, it's, this is a different computer. The whole thing is host, and I can't even drag the thing over to the other screen. But I mean, it's turned on and I have an F written on the screen over here, but I just can't get anything over there. But it's almost working. So, okay, so Frank. Sorry, y'all. Use, use imagination, picture me writing the word Frank. Okay. So, Frank, if packs of chewing gum, well, five packs, five, six of big red or whatever it is, juicy fruit, yeah. At a buck and a quarter piece, Frank says, I'm not going to buy any gum. I'm not going to chew any gum because five a, duck, a, a buck and a quarter per pack is crazy talk. But if the price of gum, let's just call this a month, I guess that would be more logical. If the price of gum got down to a dollar a pack, yeah, that's kind of insane. But he is actually, you know, okay, I'll treat myself to one pack a week. I'll buy four packs a month. If the price dropped down to a quarter, it's just 75 cents, well, he chew more, 75 cents, well, that's not so bad, and I'll get 12 of them, so I'll get what, three packs a week. If it goes down to 50 cents, Frank will eat, eat, chew 20 packs. If it gets down to a quarter a pack, he'll do 33 packs. If they were free, if they said, here, chew all the gum that you want, knock yourself out, well, his jaw's gonna get kind of tired at some point, right? Even at free, there is a stopping point for about everybody, and he's decided 50 packs of gum is the most that he will go through in a month. So that's like a pack and a, a little over a pack and a half a day. So that would be whatever. So I'm talking about the five pack pieces because that's like chewing eight pieces of gum a day. Any y'all there? Amanda? Okay, Amanda likes gum. Okay. But the rest of us, not so much. <laughs> Yeah, if your jaw is completely tired after chewing six, seven, eight, ten pieces of gum during the day, then what would they have to do to get you to chew more? They'd have to pay you, right? <laughs> do that. I'll pay you to chew gum. Not gonna help. So, for anything in life, if you have two columns of related numbers, you can make a graph, a chart, whatever the word is. Just, you can graph whenever you have two related numbers, like we did age and height, we had two numbers that were related, we could graph it. We had the number of alcoholic drinks and the number of dates, you could graph it. The number of days that you skip class and you grade, you could graph it. So the demand curve is just a graph, a picture that's going to describe what that demand schedule looks like. Okay, and the point of this is when you remember, I've told you pictures worth a thousand words. This will help when we get to the next slide. But the point of this is to show how the market price is going to change customer behavior. We've got a pretty good idea. When the price of gum goes lower, Frank and the rest of us will chew more. If the price of gum gets higher, Frank and the rest of us won't chew any, right? But 
you can get a lot clearer picture just by looking at the picture. Okay. That's grammatically poor. Okay. So uh, I'm going to have to do it this way. Just get my slides are pulling. If we were to graph Frank's demand schedule, we would get a curve that kind of looks like this. At a buck and a quarter each, he wasn't eating any of them. He wasn't showing any of it. At a dollar piece, he would chew four packs and 75 cents each, he's chewing eight. At a quarter, he's chewing, I don't know whatever that number was, 28, something like that. At three, zero. All right. Dude, I wish I could get my markers. Try what? Seriously. See, I've got writing, but it's on the other screen. Or it's not on my PowerPoint. So at least I've got that going. Okay, we're ready for the nightmare. <laughs> I promise you this is not work. Problem is, is it thinks the other monitor is the main monitor, not this one. I'm sorry, y'all. I know this is fantastic. Uh, no, I mean, it, I, I turned the app off and it just automatically came back on and started drawing on the wrong screen. It's just because it's got the wrong screen. Anyway, it just program. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyway, so this is Frank's demand curve for, what was it? The gum. Okay, so <laughs> this one re really doesn't illustrate it, but see over here when we get to this area, the curve is a lot steeper. You get a small cha uh, change in, well, decent size change in price isn't really going to change how much he eats or chews, right? But then down here, if you lower the price a little bit, you get a big change, right? So you can sort of look and see, well, and what's going to happen if the gum if the gum goes up beyond a buck and a quarter pack? He's going to keep buying nothing. He's going to keep buying nothing. So remember the slope and y-intercept stuff that we talked about a few weeks ago? It's going to kill me that I can't draw on here. Your y-intercept is your starting point. For Frank, a buck and a quarter, he starts thinking about gum. He isn't buying any yet, but he starts thinking about it. At a dollar, he's going to be buying four packs. So what would happen at a dollar ten? Well, we didn't ask him, but maybe at a dollar ten, he's going to buy three packs. Maybe maybe at a dollar twenty-four, maybe he buys one pack of gum a year. That averages out to one twelfth of a pack a month. But that's bigger than zero, right? So somewhere along the line, you know, his demand when you go beyond a buck and a quarter, it's going to be just a straight line up here, and that's utterly meaningless, right? So we won't really graph that. We sort of get to this starting point here. But Frank, 
at a buck and a quarter, he's interested. And then as the price goes down, he's going to chew more. And the price gets lower, he chews more. The price gets lower, he chews more. Until it gets to the point down here, the price can't get any lower. So what are you going to have to do in order to get him to chew more? You'd have to pay him. The price would have to be a negative number. You chew a piece of gum and I'll give you a quarter. How many of you would do that? Somebody comes up to you, you, know, you, you give me a piece. I wouldn't trust that person for the life of me. Why are you paying me to chew a piece of gum? What is it like? Has it been licked by roaches or what's going on with it? Just, I just, some of y'all are braver than I am, but we can hang out with better quality people than I do. But you can visually see what's going on here. And the demand curve is generally going to be sloped like this. But this is sort of Frank's demand curve. But what you can, we do is we take Frank's demand for gum. We take Preston's demand for gum, Loveline's demand for gum, Jenny's demand for gum, Lestar's demand. For, we just take it all together and we get the overall demand for gum for the classroom, the city, the county, the, the college, the state, right? But in reality, as a company, were you going to be operating down here? You're only going to be giving your gum away for free, right? So this bottom end of that demand curve really is meaningless, right? But how about up here at the top end? Oh, you're going to be, well, we're the luxury brand, right? We're going to be that pack of gum that nobody can afford. Even the wrapper is going to be made out of gold, right? Just so $800 a pack and no, right? So generally, the top end, the left end, and the right end of the demand curve, really nobody's going to be playing there. See, so the demand curve is going to be a, let me see if I have it. Where's my mouse? Oh. No, okay, I don't. I have a couple more generic demand curves that we'll get to a little bit later. Visually, see what we're doing here? And the picture's worth a thousand words. Remember when we had that graph when we were looking at the growth rate of kids and you could just look at it and it's steep in some places. That means the kids are growing fast. It's flat in some places. That means the kids aren't growing, right? So you visually can get this kind of thing pretty quick. So if you're in a bucket, the Frank is your only customer and you're charging a bucket and a quarter, you lower your price down to a dollar. You chop your price by 25 cents and you're only gonna sell four extra packs of gum, is that worth it? Maybe, maybe not. But what happens if you're down here and you lower your price by a quarter and you go from selling 25 packs to 55 packs, is that worth it? Yeah. Maybe. So where you are in the demand curve, the shape of the demand curve is gonna start indicating, suggesting to you and your company what price you should charge. How much money that you could make. So let's assume Frank was our only customer that we had to work with. Let's just look at those couple of points that we had. Here. If our goal is just to make the most money that we can from Frank, not profit, but let's just say income, okay? And a buck and a quarter, how much money are we making off of Frank? Nothing. Nothing. Zero packs is a buck and a quarter is a zero. And a dollar each, he was buying four packs. How much money were we getting out of Frank? Four dollars. At 75 cents each, how many packs was it? Eight? Twelve. It was 12? Mm -hmm. Okay, at 75 cents, we're getting tw selling him 12 packs of gum. Mm -hmm. What's 75 cents times 12? Nine dollars. So we get nine dollars out of him. Lowering our price, we get more money from it. Right. So nine is better than four, four is better than zero. So, okay, well, what happens if we drop to 50 cents? How many did we sell? One. Oh, uh, according to the table uh, I had on last. Slide. It, it'll be easier if we look at the numbers here. At 50 cents, we may sell 20 packs to him. So how much money is that? $10. So 10 is better than nine. At 25 cents, we get 33, we sell 33 packs to him. That's eight twenty five. Uh -huh. Eight twenty five. Ooh, so we're making less money from him. So that 50 cents is what you hold. $10. Quite possibly. Probably. If it's first passed, yes. Yeah. If you're 50 cents and you lower your price to 25, what are you doing? You're doing more work. You got to make that many more packs of gum and you bring in less money. You go from bringing in $10 to only bringing in 
825, you said? 825. So how many of you want to work harder for less? Tell your boss I'll work double shifts and you can cut my paycheck. No. So would you ever want to drop from 50 cents down to a quarter? No. So you don't want to start going below 50 cents. So if you are, are already at a quarter, what maybe should you do? Raise your price, right? Sometimes raising your price is going to bring you more money. That's something that we're going to get to slightly later this month. Now, the question between 75 cents and 50 cents. 75 cents, we were making how much? $9. So we could make $9 off of him or $10 off of him. What is it going to cost us to get that extra dollar? You've got to do almost twice a quarter, right? We got to go from making 12 packs of gum to making 20 packs of gum. Is it worth making eight more packs of gum doing 40% or no, that's like 60% more work just to get that extra dollar? That's something that you got to think about. But pure math, if our goal is to get the most money out of his pocket possible without robbing him, then we would sell at 50 cents a piece because there's no price that will get more money away from Frank than that price. So you don't want to be up here. You don't want to be down there. The company is going to try to find us. If you're running the drink machine at the end of the hallway, is this valuable information to know? Yeah. Absolutely. Because this tells you several things. Number one, what price should we charge? Number two is, well, you can't charge a different price for the Dr. Pepper than you do for the Pepsi, right? So, so it'll give you an idea of, well, if I'm selling, just this example. If I'm running a snack machine down the hallway and I'm going to try to sell my packs of gum for a dollar a piece, I really probably only need to show up and refill that machine, what, a couple times a year, right? But if I'm putting my gum in that machine and I'm trying to sell them for a quarter a piece, I know I need to show up on campus and reload that machine once a week, right? So it gives you an idea how often you need to come and fill up those machines, that kind of stuff, right? As well as you know, well, how much can I start charging these college students for my sodas and zero bars and that kind of stuff to get the most money out of these college students that I can? I being whoever runs those machines, it ain't me. So don't blame me. It's not my fault. Yes, that stuff in those machines is kind of expensive. So, what's the root word of determinants? Determine. What determines our demand? What determines our willingness and ability to consume? What did it do? <laughs> there, there's an asterisk there. Basically there. What determines that Frank is willing to chew gum and able to chew gum? That Loveline is willing to eat M&M's and able to eat M&M's. That Preston is able to do cocaine and willing to do cocaine. The other way you can a little bit think of it is what makes us interested in the product. So, the first one I'm going to go with is something the econ textbooks talk about. Taste and preferences. In short, do you like it? Or are you not allergic to it? Loveline is willing and able to eat regular M&M's, but she's allergic to the peanut M&M's, so is she going to be buying them? No, because she would prefer not to eat something that will kill her, right? So she prefers not to do that. So you, even if they put the M&M's on sale, she ain't going to eat them. No, come on, Loveline, buy one, get one free. You know, got, buy one pack of death, get another pack of death free. No, right? So, are you interested in the product in the first place? If you ain't interested in broccoli, you ain't going to that part of the store, right? Might be a good fight, especially Brussels sprouts and that kind of nasty stuff. Just stay away, right? Okay, do we like it? And then the other, Sam said money. True. Money in the forms of income. Do we have money to buy stuff? Do you have an income? Do you have a job? Preston may love his cocaine, but he ain't got a job, so how's he going to buy it? He's going to, well, stealing? Well, ain't that a job, in a way. 
and that's his income, right? So he's got to do something, right, to meet that demand. Loveline's going to be buying her M&Ms. If she's got a job, she can have some money and she'll spend some of it on M&Ms. If she doesn't have any job and she doesn't have any money, she's not going to buy any M&Ms, right? So, it's, so those two really go to the core of the ability and willingness. Income, are you able to buy it? Taste your preferences, are you willing to buy it? But I mean, there's, but there's a little bit more detail than that. But, but if you got those two, you're, you're well on your way there. I don't like, like I said, I don't like broccoli. I don't like Brussels sprouts. I'm not looking. I do have an income, whatever money that my wife will let me have for my paycheck. The third one is expectations. And I'll give you a hint, if you're taking one of my tests and I ask you to list some things and you run out of things to list uh, and you need another answer, expectations is an interesting, I mean, it'll work an interesting amount of the time. It's going to bubble up to the top. But expectations, what do you expect? If you expect to lose your job tomorrow, is that going to change your buying habits today? Yeah. If you think you're going to, okay, is any of you in a market for a new car? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, okay. You've been going a week. And okay, so I'm going to pick on you because you've been not getting shot at for a week now. So Kayla is looking for a car. If she thinks she's going to lose her job tomorrow, is that going to change your shopping habits? You will change it. She's going to stop looking, right? But if you think you're going to win the lottery tomorrow, is that going to change what you do? Is that going to redefine the kind of car that you're looking for? Yeah. So... <laughs> yes, but hopefully she didn't buy it before the lottery winnings come through, but at least she's shopping online and she's looking at these nice cars, so she knows which of the nice cars she would buy. She's done her research, but, but we know, you know, Jen, a lot of us, those of y'all that are thinking about TVs, you're thinking, well, I'm going to wait because if I can wait a few weeks, maybe I can get a good deal on Black Friday. Those of you that are interested in getting a new iPhone, well, guess what? Apple is going to be introducing their next iPhone in the next few weeks. So if you're a wise iPhone buyer, you're going to wait a few weeks. Because you would feel kind of bad if you walk in and you buy the iPhone 8, and then the very next day the new iPhone 11 that does everything comes out on the market for the very same price. That's what happened to me. I got the Galaxy S9, and the Note 9 came out. Yeah, but the Note 9 was extra $150, $200 more. So yeah, just, for the same thing. The only yes. thing that was different was a pen. It has been, yeah. So I, I still wanted it. <laughs> I had the Note 7 until it blew up. The, the Note phones has been about the only thing that's been tempting me as far as getting away from my pixels or. I, I still have scores next on my next bedside desk. Oh, cool. Yeah, so those need pixels. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Just. If you don't pay, if he does pay his heating bill for the winter, you know, he always has a note seven. Okay. But, but expectations, what do you think is going to happen? If you think the price of TVs is going to go down, you're going to wait. If you think the price of TVs is going to go up, what are you going to do? I'm going to go ahead and buy it now before it happens. Maybe if I think the price of TVs is going to go up, I'm going to buy a bunch of them and I'm going to turn around when the price goes up and I'm going to sell them to people that are desperate on eBay. And I'm thinking like whatever the toy of the year is going to be. If you can figure that joker out in the first week of November and buy a whole bunch of them and then you can sell them on eBay the third week of December for three times what you pay for, whatever the hot toy of the year is, right? Expectations are going to factor into our buying. If you expect that you're going to have a child in the next couple months or you're going to get married in the next couple months, is that going to change what happens? What you spend your money on? What you buy? Yeah. You wake up pregnant tomorrow, things will be changing. Just... <laughs> So I'm just saying, uh, or, or just even like you, you can have baby goats coming soon. Oh, geez. Oh, anyway. anyway, another thing that you and I, we don't necessarily think about it, but it's going to be the number of buyers. As far as the M&M company, they're looking at how much, how many people are willing and able to buy our product. Well, if you get more buyers, that's more people that would be willing and able to buy our product. We should be able to sell more. But you and I don't necessarily think about the number of buyers, except 
like Friday morning. No. When you're one of those people waiting in line, waiting for them to open the door and you start throwing a couple of elbows and you run in the electronics section as fast as humanly possible to be one of those three people that actually gets the TV that's on sale, right? Sometimes number of buyers. Sometimes they have a bunch, a lot of the good stuff, they only have a couple. But sometimes the number of buyers for us as individuals, but usually we're like, well, you know, I want soda, I go to soda, I don't care how many people are in the store, right? But for the company as all, for the company overall, they look at the number of buyers too. Our population, or we talked about this before, our population is growing by 3% a year here in the United States. So guess what? That kind of means, well, M&M's is kind of thinking, well, if nothing else, because there's 3% more mouths this year than there was last year, we should be selling 3% more M&M's this year than we did last year, right? Because most of those people are gonna love them some M&M's, right? As well, you should. I love you some M&M's. The next one is the price of related goods. Kayla might be okay, might be thinking, okay, I'm looking for a feel feel for, for deal free to lock. What kind of car are you looking to get? Well, I really want a 2010 Honda. That's what I'm getting. A 2000, 2010 Honda. Okay, Civic Accord. Of course. Okay, she's looking at a 2010 Accord, and they're running for probably about ten thousand dollars. She's looking at them, but if she is just happens to come across some of these Toyota Corollas, the 2010 Toyota Corolla that's for like eight thousand dollars, might that change your thinking a little bit? Yeah, because isn't a Corolla similar to the Accord? It's like, yeah, okay, the Accord, the Accord might go on sale, but what if the Corolla's got a bigger sale? I love me to sun drop, but if I see Mountain Dew on sale for a quarter piece, and I gotta pay a full dollar for a sun drop, you know, I, you know, I, might, I might have to investigate <laughs> cheating a little bit, right? Cheating. Yes. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> related goods factor into things. Yeah, you know, we have a good crop for watermelons. The price of watermelons gets cheaper, but the price of cantaloupes might be even cheaper still. It's like, yeah, it's a good deal, but that's an even better deal. We have that kind of thing comes up. Okay, and when we talk about related goods, there's two types of related goods. Number one, are they substitutes like Coke and Pepsi? Coke and Pepsi, you don't sit there and say, well, you know, I'm going to drink a Coke with a Pepsi chaser, right? You're not two-fisting it, holding a pe Coke in one hand and Pepsi in the other. You know, Preston might be with his heroin and cocaine, right? But just, you know, these can be substitutes. You're drinking one or the other. So if one of them's cheaper, you're going to drink that one instead of the other one. So Pepsi, they leave their price exactly the same, but they may sell less this week because Coke went on sale, right? And people are like, well, there ain't that much difference. But the other relationship is if they're complements, like peanut butter, jelly, and bread. For this example, the price of bread went up. Are we gonna buy more bread or less bread? Less bread. Well, if you're buying less bread, are you gonna be buying more peanut butter or less peanut butter? Less peanut butter, because it's kind of hard to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without the bread. You're just going to, what, stick your hand in the jar and, like, start licking your hand while you're walking. Crackers. Crackers, <laughs> yes. Yes. But crackers aren't as, fun, aren't as much fun for some people. It complicates things. These relationships here, it's going to impact things. The price of one thing is going to affect the other. The price of gasoline impacted the kinds of cars we were buying a few years ago when gas went up to $4 a gallon. People start saying, hey, electric, score. The price of gas is going down, so what's happened? People are like, ooh, big cars now, big trucks now. We're so far back into driving our trucks and SUVs that Ford Motor Company is going to stop making cars. They're all in trucks, SUVs, and they're keeping the Mustang. Just so they have something that they can run on an NASCAR circuit, I guess. I don't know. But other than the Mustang, the, the whatever, the Taurus, and the what, Ford 500 or Fusion or whatever those cars are, they're going to stop making them because the price of gas is cheaper. 
change what we're thinking about cars. We're back to buying cars that we can actually fit in, all right? <laughs> so these are things to determine, are we interested in the product or not? What's missing from this list? Uh, location, do you think? Like price? Location, maybe. Who said price? The star. <laughs> you can. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, you go, girl. She gets the point. A lot of people, it's like price. Price is not on this list. Because these are things that determine are you interested in the product in the first place? Price just determines, now that you're interested, how much are you going to buy? I'm not interested in Brussels sprouts, so I don't give a crap what the price is, right? I'm not even going to go to that part of the store, right? And I'm not going to be, even if I happen to go to that side of the store and I see Brussels sprouts, buy one, get one free, I don't care. If they do Brussels sprouts for a penny a pound, I don't care. because I don't want them because I don't like them, right? But if we're interested in something, that's going to deter, the price is going to determine, well, now that you're interested, you go into that part of the store and you're looking and then you start looking at how much money's in your wallet, what the price tag is, and figuring out how many packs of M&Ms or how many whatever that you are walking out of the store with. If you don't like soda, when you fill up your car at the gas station, you aren't even going into that part of the store, right? But if you are thirsty and whatever, and you do like soda, and then you, you sometimes you walk into the store and you're going to be like, yeah, I'm thirsty, but I don't want to pay a buck and a quarter for these things. Other days you walk in there, I'm thirsty, and I will pay the buck and a quarter and buy the drink, right? The price is going to determine how much we buy, but it's not going to determine our interest in the first place. Does that make sense to you? The other thing, for you mathematical completists, you know who you are. I'm not going to say you're weirdo, but you know. Price is already factored in right here. Those determinants of demand determine the shape of your demand curve. Determine does it exist and what is it shaped like? The price is, or determines where the demand curve is, the price is going to be helping to determine the shape of that demand curve. Does that make sense to you? What I'm trying to say? Let me look for a slide right quick. We tried to do that without causing anybody a seizure. Okay. Um, okay. I'm trying to think, I'm about to do something out of order and it's gonna kill me that I don't have any matters. Picture, this is Frank's demand for gum. Picture somebody, what happens if somebody has a demand for gum that is a straight line, 75 cents, flat. Constant. Does that make sense to you? This would be, give me the name of the human. George. Constance. Constance, yeah, constant is constant. She's gonna pay 75 cents. If gum is selling for 76 cents, she ain't gonna buy. If gum sells for 74 cents, she ain't gonna buy. But if it's selling for 75 cents, exactly 75 cents, she'll buy, and how much she'll buy, it just depends on how much she feels like. Does that make sense to you? No, you'll never see a flat demand curve. How about a demand curve that's straight up and down? Let's call the person, I don't know, Bill. And it's straight up and down. Bill is going to chew 28 packs of gum. Whether it's selling for a quarter, whether it's selling for a dollar, whether it's selling for five dollars, 28 packs of gum a month. What can you tell me about Bill? He what? He likes his gum. Addict. <laughs> That's the one possibility. He is an addict. Because what's the behavior here? He's got to have what he's got to have. Price doesn't matter. Not mentioning Preston's name. He's got to have a price. He's got to have what he's got to have. Price doesn't matter. So I don't care if it's a quarter or a buck and a quarter. I got to have my 28 packs of gum. So maybe Bill is addicted. 
Who else is there out there to where price doesn't matter? Yeah, what if Bill's last name was Gates? Do you think Bill has a clue what the Bill Gates has a clue what the price of gum is? No, he just rolls up to somebody and says, Give me a pack of gum. Wasn't that, wasn't that just on one of those shows? Oh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, they did a video. Oh, yes. He, he, he was utterly clueless on the price of milk and that kind of stuff. And apparently, Donald Trump, I heard the other day, somebody was asking him questions or something, that, or so, and he thought you had to have an ID card in order to go to the grocery store. What? It's like, <laughs> yeah. just their whole different level. They're just like, you know, they don't think about price because they've got so much money. But, and it's the money, it's the price relative to your income. Because, you know, oh, $1, $2, $5 for a pack of gum when you've got 18 billion, doesn't matter. How do y'all react if y'all, y'all you know, know that little double bubble, one penny bubble gum that they have at the grocery store, in the yeah. convenience store? Would y'all like get mad and start flipping people off if they were selling it for two cents a piece? No, you'd be like, I want a pack, I want a piece of gum, and I'm going to get a piece of gum, and I'll pay two pennies instead of one. You don't think about it, right? So it's price relative to our income, and unfortunately, most of us are normal people, and our income is not stellar. So the price of everything, that relationship ends up being important. The price right? of everything bothers us. Yes, the price of everything bothers us. Good wording there. But straight up and down, okay, you could have it. Maybe it's addictive behavior, but that's somebody that price doesn't matter, right? But how about somebody whose domain curve is kind of shaped like this? For those of you following along at home, I'm trying to do a line. Think about a clock, go from 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock, draw a line to that angle. <laughs> um, people at home. So a line that looks like this. What happens there? A small change in price doesn't lead to much change in how much they buy. They will slow down buying some, but not a whole lot. What is it going to take to get this person to really stop buying whatever the product is? That price has got to go way, 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 way up. That would be my demand curve for sun drop. <laughs> right? If the price gets expensive, okay, instead of, you know, you know maybe a couple of days, also come to drinking a Dr. Pepper, put it in the rotation, or Pepsi, put it in the rotation, instead of drinking two or three sun drops a week in the office every day, you know, I'll cut back a little bit. But in order to make me go cold turkey, no longer drinking sun drops, and that's expensive. <laughs> if they stop making it, then if my name was Lovely and I would be eating a pack of peanut m and <laughs> 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 Like, you know, there's people on eBay for that. Like, they sell like discontinued items. Yes. You can get a sundrop from like 1980. <laughs> yes. Yes. You die uh, happy, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They still have a sundrop. Yeah, I'll, I'll have that sundrop that I'll use to help me swallow a pack of peanut m and I'm committing suicide with, and there we go. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not allergic to peanuts, so. So just, I don't ever say that again. <laughs> ever say that again. <laughs> but what you can see to somebody who's got a demand curve that's fairly steep, a big change in price isn't going to lead to that big of a change in their behavior, right? But if somebody who's demand curve, kind of like Frank, is it ain't super flat, but it's kind of flat, well, then a the change in price can lead to a pretty huge change in their behavior. And that's based on how well is he like gum. If you're like, eh, okay, gum's okay, well then your demand curve is probably going to be relatively flat. If you're like, I'm a gumaholic, your demand curve is going to be fairly straight, up and down. But price is just sort of now that you're interested. Are you a hardcore sun dropaholic, or are you like, eh, it, price is going to be determining based on that behavior how many numerically you're going to come home with. But price doesn't enter into making your decision of do you like it or not. Those of you that don't like sun drop, obviously you've never tasted it before, right? When you taste it, you can be like, dude, now I see what I've been missing all this time. And your behavior is going to change. It doesn't matter about the price. What? He didn't stop sun drop. He stopped drinking soda in general. 
and I'm happy for you. Well, I, this is my last one for today. I actually cut up because I, I don't need y'all know how I am now, and I'm. This is only my second soda of the day. Just I don't need more caffeine in my life. Just telling you. But our tastes, our preferences, our income, we change. So our demand changes. Do you listen to the same music that you were listening to when you were five? No. no. Okay, sometimes. <laughs> Mostly, no. Do you eat the same foods that you were eating when you were five? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, yeah, we all still eat macaroni and cheese, right? right? Yes, okay. Ladies, maybe y'all are like expanding out, eating, y'all at the point you're eating salads and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Congratulations. No? Good. She got her. <laughs> and you all like her. Yes. Oh, but. We don't listen to the same music, we don't watch the same TV shows, we don't eat the same food, we don't wear the same clothes, we don't play with the same toys. Because we're not playing with Legos anymore. Bobby's trying to play with a Galaxy S9, right? <laughs> uh, it, so we change. Is your income the same as it was when it was five? Yeah. And you hope that your income is gonna be different a little bit later on in life, right? So when, any of those things on that list of determinants with any of those changes, it's going to redefine where your demand curve is. Your demand is actually going to shift. You make more money, that's not going to suddenly make love lean, not allergic to peanuts anymore, right? If I make more money, that's not going to suddenly, I've got more money in my pocket, I like Brussels sprouts. No. <laughs> but what those say is based on our decision, based on our behavior, well, if I got more money, yeah, I can buy more sun drop. If Frank has more money, he can buy more chewing gum, no matter what the price is. If the price stayed exactly the same, he would buy more gum than he did before he got the pay raise. And if the price went higher, he would buy more than he used to based on his old income. Lestara, uh, not Lestara, okay, you win that lottery. What all are you going to be buying that you haven't been buying? Everything. So her demand for a lot of things is pretty close to that y-axis. Is there, if only the price would get low enough, and unfortunately the price ain't low enough because your income ain't there, but as your, as your income goes up, those curves are going to go out to the right. She can't afford to buy more, and she will buy more. Bill Gates is chewing more gum and drinking more sodas than he was when he was y'all's age. Right, because he was broke when he was y'all's age. But I didn't make as much. Hmm? How did he make his money? He got somebody else to make some make DOS, and then he sort of repackaged it and put a label on it, and he sold it to somebody else. Uh, I can't remember who he got started with, and then it just went from there. Sold it to a company, and, but it, but it's somebody else's kind of. They did the programming, and he just anyway. I'm not gonna say snake oil salesman, but quite a bit of luck too. Oh yeah, being in the right place at the right time helped dramatically. But what I'm talking about, okay, somebody been keeping score. It's four now. Four. Okay. <laughs> this is a increase in our demand. We get more money. Our expectations for the future look better. The price of stuff that we like is going down. The price of stuff we hate is going up. I don't know. Our taste and preferences change. Something about the products has changed. How about you? Okay, give me somebody. Who can I pick on for a minute? Jenny. Okay, you've got those pretzels. How many pretzel bags of pretzels do you eat a week? One, two. One bag of pretzels. How much did you pay for that bag? $1.75. Okay, $1.75, she eats one pack of pretzels a week. So theoretically, this week she eats one pack, next week she eats one pack bag, the week after that she's gonna eat one bag, that's kind of where she is. That's her lot in life. You open up the, okay, y'all don't read the newspaper. Where do you get the news from? Oh, you open up the news app on your phone, you see the headline that says, eating pretzels will cure cancer, make you faster, make you smarter, make you stronger, make you smell better. Is that going to change the way you think about pretzels? Yeah. Yeah. So are you going to keep eating just one bag of pretzels a week? No. Day. She's going to. Three. 
she's going to eat more bags of pretzels. If the price of pretzels goes up, well, to $3 a bag, well, she would be eating more at $3 a bag now than she would have been eating at $3 a bag before the news hit, right? No matter what the price, she is willing to eat more pretzels now than she was before. The price is just going to determine where she's going to be. Her demand is shifted. She's more interested. How many of you would start eating pretzels if pretzels did all of that? Okay, I'll be trying to do a pretzel I bean, right? <laughs> yeah. So she got the new demand curve, but if the price goes up, then she made a buying. And if the price goes at dollar seventy-five, she's now only need three bags a week, so one to three. But if those evil blankety blanks that run that company jack the price up ten dollars a bag, well, ten dollars a bag, she might find herself back to only eating one bag a week, right? But that's $10 for a bag that is delicious, nutritious, and cures cancer, and makes you smell good and run fast and whatever all of those things are, right? But if that bag didn't do any of that stuff, all it did was just taste good, right now, she's buying one bag at $1.75, or what would happen if they went to $10? She ain't gonna be eating it, right? Eating Doritos. Eating Doritos. <laughs> Unless the Doritos went up to $10 bag too. Right. So. You get a whole new demand curve. When anything changes, you get good news, bad news, and it's going to change your demand curve. Good news is going to increase our demand. Our demand is going to shift to the right. Is curing cancer, running faster, smelling better, and stronger, and whatever, all that stuff was, is that good? Yeah. Uh, is you winning the lottery good? Yeah. Getting a new job? Good. Better paying job, I should just say that. Yeah. Better paying job? Good. Yes. If it's good news for us, we'll eat more. That evolves. That would matter. Better paying job with them. But if it's bad news, alternate universe for you Star Trek people. Alternate universe. Jenny right now pays dollar seventy-five for a bag of pretzels. She only eats one bag a week. She eats a bag a week. Jenny opens up the news app on her phone tomorrow, and it says, eating pretzels will make your lips fall off. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a pretty bad news. Are you going to say, oh, well, that's okay. Who needs lips anyway? I'm going to keep eating a bag of pretzels a week. No, I wouldn't think so. So what would happen? She is less interested in buying, right? They had, the, the pretzel company hadn't changed the price, but she went from buying one bag of pretzels to no bag of pretzels. Our demand just went. So then the pretzel company's got to do what? We want to keep her from leaving. So maybe we got to lower our price to try to, how low did, does this price have to, how low would the price of pretzels have to be for you to keep eating them in spite of the fact it causes your lips to fall off? Three yeah, they have to pay me. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, I'm going to the extreme there. But if you lose your job, well, she ain't buying the name brand pretzels like she's got now. She's buying Food Lion brand, <laughs> right? She, you got to make those decisions there. If you lose your job, you, if you wake up tomorrow and you find out that you're allergic to pretzels, that's going to change things. It's going to change your willingness and ability to buy. You wake up tomorrow and you find that the alien motherships have arrived and they're like conquering the country and they're on their way towards your home. That's going to change things, right? So, I have said this, I'll put this for you OCD people, but the rest of you sort of go along with it. If what I've got between this slide and the next slide, oh, I guess this this one, it just follow me verbally instead of this. If the price changes, you just move to another point on the same demand curve. If anything besides the price changes, you go to a whole new demand curve. You get a shift. If rolled gold changed the price of pretzels, well, Jenny already has her demand for pretzels. It says, well, at $1.75, I'll buy one pack. At $1.50, I'll buy two packs. At $2, I'll buy no packs. If they change their price, she's just going to land and look at it in her subconscious mind. She's going to look on the demand curve and see where she lands, how many she's going to buy. 
She's gonna say, I get a dollar seventy-five cents worth of enjoyment out of a bag, but not two dollars worth. No, thank you. She walks away. But if anything else changes, her income, her job, the cancer causing or cancer curing properties of the thing, her expectations for whether they're gonna be on sale next week or not, her expectations for whether her boyfriend is being abducted by aliens, all of those expectations, they're what she thinks is gonna to happen to the price of Doritos, what she, what she thinks is gonna to happen to the price of spark plugs, all that stuff is going to be shifting the way she thinks about the pretzels. So in that case, you get a whole new demand curve. That's what we mean by shifting. You're shifting to a new demand curve. You with me on that? Price changes, you're still in the same ball game. If anything other than price changes, you get a whole new demand. So. We've already talked about this, so I'll kind of speed up a little bit. The market demand curve is the demand curve for all the buyers in the market. Now, what's the market for that stack machine at the end of the hallway? It's all the people in this classroom, all the people in the other classrooms on this hallway, the people in offices across the hallway, the classrooms and offices down the hall, over there in A building where the important people are, people that signed the front of my paycheck. Right. Yeah. Uh, all of them, how many M&Ms are they willing and able to buy? How many Dr. Peppers are they willing and able to buy? How many zero bars, zero, are they willing and able to buy? Right. That's gonna be our demand for the market. We're going to take every, of our, every one of our individual demands, put them together to come up with a demand for the entire college, the entire county, the entire state. But the market demand is just a bunch of demand curves of individual people added together. So. Don't start reading the slide. Let's just parse the title. Law. True. Diminishing. What's that mean? Shrinking. Shrinking. Getting small. Marginal. Extra from the first week of class. All right. Shrinking. Extra. Utility was. No. No. Was Usefulness. Satisfaction. Enjoying it. Shrinking. Extra. Usefulness. Shrinking. Extra. Enjoyment. Shrinking. Extra. Satisfaction. This is why the demand curve is downwardly sloping. Because the more you consume, the less enjoyment you're going to get out of each one. The more you have, the less usefulness you're going to get out of each one. It's a hot day and you've been out mowing grass for three hours. You're thirsty. How fantastically fantabulous is the first you name the beverage that you, when you that you pull out of the refrigerator and drink. Great. How great is that's fantastic. How much would you be willing to pay for a drink in that situation? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> After you drank that first one and you've cooled off a little bit, how good is the second one? Still pretty good. It's pretty good, but is 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 it as good as the first one? No. Okay, now you finish that one and then you drink the third one. It ain't as good as the second one. You drink the fourth one, you start to get a little bit waterlogged and your stomach's doing a little shaking. You start drinking the fifth one and you're throwing up, right? How much are you willing to pay for a drink that's gonna make you throw up? Did we have this discussion a week ago? How much are you willing to pay for the drink that's gonna make you throw up? <laughs> Not a whole lot, right? Because that first one is gonna do a whole lot for us because we're really, really thirsty and that thing's gonna taste really, really good, so I'm willing to pay a bunch of money for it. Remember the Looney Tunes cartoon where it's, Speedy Gonzales and Daffy Duck and Daffy ends up with a diamond and Speedy's out there with a glass of water and at the end what ends up happening? Daffy coughs up the diamond in order to get that glass of water, right? Because they're out there in the desert somewhere. Have y'all seen that cartoon? Do y'all watch that particular one? Do you y'all watch Looney Tunes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Just if you didn't, that's your next homework assignment. <laughs> I'm like, I would probably get in trouble just if I should just start playing Looney Tunes for like six, seven minutes beginning of class each day. But I'll work for econ. Eat uh, zero candy bars and eat watch Looney Tunes. So yes. It seemed like there was another homework assignment too. Okay. Besides yeah. drinking a sundrop. That's not, that's not an assignment. That's just 
joy. So I'm trying <laughs> that tonight. I've never had this. Um, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so, something that tastes, oh, this is so fancy. We're willing to pay a bunch of money for it. Something that tastes like, oh, this, this tastes like throwing up ready to happen. We ain't willing to pay as much for it. If Kay, she gets a new car. You get a new car right now. How many days in a week are you going to drive it? All seven. Okay. So you get that car and you get a second one just like it. Different color. How many days you can drive that second car? Not so, is she going to get, is she going to do double the driving because she went from having one car to two cars? No. She's no. wasting gas. So, yeah. So, what, so what's going to end up happening? Well, she's like, okay, I'll drive this car three and a half days. And I'll drive that car three and a half days. So she's getting three and a half days worth of use, where if she only had one car, she's getting seven days worth of use out of it. What about that third car? If she got a third third car just like the other two, but with a different color, and then fourth and fifth, while well, she's getting to, well, I can fashionally coordinate my cars with my shoes. And probably, you know, or she, she, get, she gets seven cars, or so she's like, I've got one for each day of the week. So then she's got these cars, each, that, that seventh car that she gets is only going to get driven one day a week, right? If that, if it matches her shoes, right? <laughs> so to go from having you know, six cars to seven cars, that ain't a life changing event. To go from zero cars to one car, that's huge. Maybe going from one car to two cars, that's still fairly significant. But each extra, so how much are you willing to pay for a car that you're going to drive all seven days a week? A lot. How much are you willing to pay for a car that you're only going to drive one day a week? Depends on what it is. Not a whole lot. If you're like a car aficionado or something, like you might pay more. Yeah, uh, if you're a car aficionado and it's a collector's item, something, yeah, maybe. But for us normal folk, no. It just ain't happening. Right. So, because then you might even feel guilty about the car sitting out there rusting in the parking lot on the uh, parking lot. Like, where the crap am I going to park seven cars, right? It, right? You got that issue too? Yeah. <laughs> so, when. The more that we eat, the more that we drink, our enjoyment for each extra one is going to go down. So, we get to the point of the companies, th this, is, this is psychology here, right? This ain't rocket science. Our companies recognize this. Companies recognize that Jenny's not going to get as much enjoyment out of a second bag of pretzels as she, as she is the first bag of pretzels. So what do they have to do to entice her to get the second bag? Buy one, get one free, which is a form of lowering the price, right? Lower the price, because you could say, I'm not going to get $1.75 worth of enjoyment out of that second bag, but maybe I'll get 75 cents worth of enjoyment out of it, a dollar's worth of enjoyment out of it. So if they, you know, if they lower the dollar piece, yeah, I'll buy two bags. No, and then I'll get, uh, get the dollar's worth of enjoyment out of the second one. But what would it take for me to buy three for her to buy three bags in a week? Maybe you'd have to go down to a quarter piece or something like that, right? So if they want us to buy more, they're going to have to lower the price. Or, I mean, that's why the demand curve is shaped that way. So th what's their other option? It's kind of hard for them to lower the price because uh, how much they got to pay for their whatever wheat, corn, whatever stuff is in there and salt and whatever and pay their employees and so if they want to get more money out of it, they want her to buy more pretzels. Option number one, lower their price. That ain't easy. What's the other option? Make the product do more for us, taste and preferences, or lie to us and convince us that the product will do more to it for us. That's where advertising is coming in. You know, make the product that, uh, you know, we, we find out we put this extra additive in the pretzels and it's going to cause you to cure cancer or whatever. Or some science somewhere has discovered the whatever, whatever, but these things are better for you, faster for you. Well, that's kind of hard to do. But think about like WD-40. How many of y'all know WD-40? You don't eat it, right? You don't drink it. But WD-40. What is WD-40? Uh, that's exactly it's water displacement formula number 40 a lot of people use it well my the hinges hinges of my door squeak I'm spraying it 
Uh, I've got uh, some sticky something on my kitchen counter. I spray it with WD-40. We've got a thousand, there are websites out there dedicated to a thousand uses of WD-40. It was made, well, it was to, more to prevent rust. If you've got water in a thing, you spray this stuff in there and it gets the water out to prevent the rust from happening in the first place. That's what it's, it's displacing the water, moving the water. But, so how many of you need a water displacement? The, no. But how many of us have WD-40 in our house? A bunch of, because there's all those other uses. So you have people other than civil engineers and machinists buying WD-40. That's increasing the demand for the product because it does more for us. It smells good too, right? I don't know. Actually, this kind of, I like the smell of it. But uh, the other thing we do is, hey, look at the cool people that are walking around with the iPhone 10 or the can of WD-40 or whatever. It's like, you see, you see Cardi B on her next video, she's out there waving a couple cans of WD-40 and everybody's like, well, I want to be like her, and boom, and, right? So what else can they do to make us think that WD-40 is better, is cooler? What does that <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to what's left of my brain. <laughs> or do you know? So, I mean, that's what they got to do. They've got to come up with some way that our product does more for you than you thought. Our product does more for you than it used to do for you. Or we got to raise our prices because we can't give you, we can't give you a pay raise, can we? WD-40 can't give you a pay raise so you can buy more WD-40, right? No. They can't manage your expectations, right? Not really. Number of buyers, WD-40 can't make you have more babies and other people have more, no. <laughs> yep. They're not legally supposed to do anything about the price of the competing products because that's kind of price fixing and cooperative. Uh, there, there's a word that I can't think of, but they, they're not price fixing. They're not supposed to, no, they're still, anyway, cartel behavior, whatever the word is. Yeah, they're not supposed to do that. So all they can do is we either lower our prices, it's tough to do, or we try to mess with what you think this product can do for you. We prefer to be having water displacement products that make us look cool rather than water displacement products that make us look like we're weird. So we're gonna use WD-40 instead of Chesterson or whatever the name of the other thing is. Not Chesterson, it begins with, it begins with a C and has 10 letters in it. Anyway. Um, Crap, that's gonna bother me now. But anyway, uh, what else can they do? Uh, okay, it was my marketing class that talked about this. Beauty products, makeup, hair stuff. Every two months, three months, there's some sticker on a thing saying new and improved. And it's the same thing. Because they're trying to convince, it's better than it was before, so go ahead and buy it. Come back to us, I know when you left us for somebody else, or you know, go ahead and buy more of us. We knew and improved. And half the time, so the, if you look at it, it's like, it's a new look. We changed the color, the bottle. The new look on the bottle of shampoo. I don't care, right? But they do whatever they can to try to get people to get them to buy more, to demand more than they were demanding already. Well, I work as a stocker at Food Lion, and a lot of the Food Lion boxes for like the nature's own organic stuff looks very mm -hmm. appealing. To yes. normal like consumers so like the say like organic cereal doesn't look that great but captain crunch is like colorful and flashy fruit loops are colorful and flashy so more people are going to be like enticed to buy that even though this organic cereal might be the exact same thing yeah the, the a lot of the generics really in last few years they've really stepped up their labeling but still believe it or not it's a huge expense to go from printing in one color to two colors trying to do three four or five it's a huge increase in expense for doing it because it's got to go through the printer once for each layer of color that you do. Yeah, right. It gets pretty expensive. So that's why y'all don't remember because y'all were young, but way back in the day, a lot of the generic product, I mean, you got like a yellow box with black print about like this on it. This is corn flakes, nothing else, no pictures, no nothing. It's just plain, ugly, yellow box. And so they really, you know, they, they've done a lot better job of pack managing their packaging to get people's attention. But still, you know, they, they're making so much less money that it's kind of a narrow window that they can get. So they're like, well, let's forget about cardboard and do the plastic bags and that kind of stuff. Instead of putting it in a bag and putting that bag in a box, well, we just put it in a bag. 
saves a little bit of money, but then of course the cereal gets crushed a little bit more. And, you, and I think they've overcompensated on the, you know, you, you get the, 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 the cocoa pebbles, you put them in milk and after about three minutes, they're getting soft and soggy. And so the generic store brand, they're like, well, we don't want people to be thinking that about it. So they make their so, I don't know, tougher than woodpecker lips that, you know, I mean, you pour the milk in there and that's gonna still stay crunchy five, 10, 15 minutes, but it doesn't have anywhere near the flavor because it's not dissolving and turning the milk into chocolate, right? They've kind of overcompensated that way. And so what you do is you just fill your bowl half full with the real stuff and then you eat it down and you refill that bowl half full about eight times and everybody wins. And so how do you eat cereal, right? No. Um, but the, the whole advertising, marketing, all that kind of stuff, their goal, all advertisement is about doing this to you, shifting your demand curve, make you buy more. Ooh, uh, Colin Kaepernick, oh. Nike. Y'all heard about that story in the last two days? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why is Nike doing it? Well, people are talking about Nike. And maybe they talk about Nike and a few people are taking their Nike shoes and protests and setting their shoes on fire, which is kind of stupid because Nike's already got you money, so you're just hurting yourself, not them. But people are like, well, some people are like, well, you know, I don't really watch football and whatever, but, you know, I like what Kaepernick stands for, so maybe I will check out a pack, pair of Nikes next time around. Or there are some people going to Nike.com and looking at these $300, $500 custom-made Nike shoes that you can get and that kind of stuff. And for some people. Bad for publicity is publicity. Yeah, anyway. publicity is publicity. If they ain't talking about you, you're disappearing. So even if they're talking smack about you, they're noticing you. They're talking about you. How many people do you know in high school that did stupid stuff as a cry out for help because they were feeling invisible? Right. Welcome to marketing. Is your point outside the door? Oh no, uh, no. Uh, Miss, Miss George is out there and. I, I didn't want to like do the middle fingers, but then you just, anyway, I will in a minute. So any questions on any of this? Okay, well, that's it for here. Um,